Good morning. So thanks to everyone for being here today, and welcome to TCU and the Neely School of Business and our attending executive speaker series. It's a great series this year, and I think we'll have fun this morning. Let me start off first and thank our sponsors, as we always do. We could not do this series without the help of our sponsors. From day one, Frost Bank has been our lead sponsor, and we want to thank them uh, very much for all the work and support you've done through the years. So thank you, Frost Bank, with that. So. We have several others that have, have joined in through the years, and I want to recognize them uh, as well. Our, our gold sponsor uh, is the Fort Worth Business Press. Our silver sponsors are Lindbeck, Cockrell Innovation, and the Valcom Agency. And our bronze sponsors are Dunaway, McDonald Sanders, Acme Brick, Byrne, and Gensler. So again, thank you for all the sponsors. So. Well, this is going to be a fun day for me. Um, I've actually known our speaker, uh, Brad Coleman, since he was about that tall. Um, he was a next door neighbor when I was, lived in Ohio. And it's been fun to watch his career. Uh, I've known him as a friend, but also to watch his career through the years. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in accounting from Miami University. Um, some people say Miami of Ohio, but we, they like to say Miami University uh, as well. Has his master's degree from Ohio State University. Has a very interesting career. Uh, he started out, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. He started out with the Columbus Clippers, and we'll talk about what happened there. He went on to the Cincinnati Reds, uh, worked with them uh, in, in the different uh, capacities. We'll again talk about those. He was a scout for the Chicago Cubs. And then the last uh, almost decade of his life, he's been working uh, on this hardwiring kind of concept, and we'll be talking about that uh, and what he's doing now. So he's a human, perform human performance specialist uh, in terms of what he does. So I think you'll enjoy it. So if you will, please welcome Brad Coleman. So. <laughs> It's good to have you here. So. It's great to be here. Brad's grown up. Um, so uh, that just shows how old I am um, with that. So it was really fun. Uh, Brad did grow up next to me. Uh, when he was, I'll tell you, when he was um, a young man, a young kid, if you went to his basement, he had all over his parents' basement baseball stats. He was like crazy. I mean, he was filled with baseball statistics. And he, so he was, there's no question, he was bound someday in his life to be in sports. So he did that. So Brad, welcome uh, here. And tell, tell us, us about, about we're gonna, I want to start off, tell us about the Columbus Clippers. How did you get into baseball? Uh, and what was the Columbus Clippers? Tell us a little bit about that and what you did there. Well, I was graduating from Miami with my degree in accounting, and I went to the career planning and placement office, and my friends were interviewing with Arthur Anderson and Deloitte and Touche, all the big eight accounting firms, and I said, yeah, when did the Yankees and the Dodgers come in for interviews? I'd like to sign up to interview with them. <laughs> Lady looked at me like I had three eyes. So I went to Ohio State, got my master's in sports management, and got an internship, and then get, ended up getting hired full-time with the Columbus Clippers, which was the AAA affiliate of the Yankees at that time. So that job was a, that was more about marketing, wasn't it? Well, the thing about minor league baseball, it's really facility management. You're running the stadium, you're selling tickets, creating the entertainment. So all those little creatures that walk around the field and do funny right. things. I never did that, but that's so, what you were kind yeah, of overseeing. Yeah, so those kind of things yeah, with that. So then after a few years with Columbus Clippers, I understand this person called Mark Schott that a lot of us know uh, invited you to come to Cincinnati Reds, right? So, so talk about that. What, how'd you start and what happened at the Reds? So. Well, it seems like a long time ago that sports, the labor situation in sports has been so good in recent years, but back the last time there was a strike, and then the replacement players. And, but during the strike, Marge had laid off most of the staff in the office of the Reds. And so I was working PR with the Clippers. And that next spring training, they were looking to start the season with replacement players. And the assistant PR director, who was the only one left in the PR department with the Reds, left during spring training. He resigned and went to the minor league hockey team in town, who tripled his salary. But that's another story. And so I said, they need somebody with experience in PR and experience in baseball and somebody that can go now. And I said, that's me. So I FedExed my resume to Marge Schott and the general manager and got an interview a couple days later and was hired a week later. So I know you ended up the last, uh, your last year there was, was general manager of the Reds, but you didn't start there. So when you started and 
and I think you know all of us know about uh, Moneyball, the Michael Lewis kind of story, but you did some work kind of way ahead of that uh, with the Reds. Kind of talk about what you did uh, in, in player development, how you thought about it, and talk about that a little bit. Well, I started in the PR department, and it's interesting today because back then there was no internet, there was no cell phones, nothing, no Twitter. Information was hard to come by. I remember scouring through week old newspapers looking for any bit of information, and I'd bring it down to the general manager and say, hey, the Tigers are looking for a pitcher. They might be a tra trade partner. And it came by 10 years later as the advent of the internet. There was so much information, you were sorting through it to try and figure out what was worthwhile and what you should ignore. But after the first year, I moved down from PR into baseball operations and worked my way up basically by trying to work as hard as I could. I didn't know if I had some special scouting sense to be able to evaluate talent, but I said, if there's not some special scouting sense that you need, I'm going to be the hardest worker I can. So I tried to work, be, be there and do what I could for my boss and work my way up. And eventually I became, we started the first research and development, formal research and development prop department in baseball. And so we were looking at new ways of evaluating talent and developing that talent and did a lot of, we worked with the K Clinic at Duke, the K Lab did some different biomechanical research and did a lot of stuff with statistics. With the advent of computers, we were doing a lot more with the increased computer processing with analyzing performance. I know I had a chance to come to see you when you were there and I remember, so that basement stuff he had in the basement, he had up on the wall. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting. So. How did you keep, particularly at that time, how did you keep track of all the players? I mean, did you, is there a scouting system or, I mean, you had a lot in of my players. my basement? Uh, no, no, when you got to the Reds. <laughs> basement was another story. But when you got to the Reds, how did you keep up with all the players in minor leagues and all the, what, what's the system in major leagues that really makes that work? Homer, I told you that's confidential. <laughs> that's okay, that's all right. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm not sure I really understand. I mean, it's, you have a lot of charts on the wall, and you're keeping databases and yeah. spreadsheets. So, do, but you have a scouting team, right? A player, you have scouts for the Reds, yeah. and you work with them. So, and now, today baseball is so much about statistics. A lot of, right. um, and I'm a big Astros fan, and I know they use the kind of statistics there. Um, so, but you didn't have the same depth that people have. You're not measuring everything at the time, were you? What, what, what would you look for 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 a player at that time? What did you look for, say, if you had a pitcher? What was going to, how would you predict that they were going to be successful at that time? Well, that's been the revolution, really. I call it the statistical revolution in sports. That back then, you know, the scouts would use their scouting acumen, which came through experience, and also their intuition of what they see in players over time. And many of them were former players, but they would grade every potential player, whether he was an amateur playing high school or college, and then as they were professional playing in the minor leagues, and they would grade them on how they were now, like what kind of fastball, what kind of curveball, what kind of changeup, and they'd give them a present and future grade. And it was all done by the scouts, really giving their gut scouting instinct. But then as computer processing increased through the 80s and 90s, more and more we found that we could analyze statistics, and they're doing this in marketing, you know, all kinds of aspects of business even, that you can find trends and, and exploit inefficiencies. And that's basically what Moneyball was all about, exploiting inefficiencies in the system of scouting. So tell us a story about one of your successful things at the Reds. What player did you find and that you thought was, this was Brad Kuhlman's statement about how good I was as a assistant general manager, general manager. What, what worked? Who worked? <laughs> the big red machine, right? Uh, it was after the big red machine. But, you know, it's so subjective in that you can make a great trade, get a great player, and he gets hurt, and things just don't work out. But when Jim Bowden was fired and then I became the GM, we made six trades in 48 hours. And we were calling every team. We put every team up on the board, and we're going down the list of who, who had interest in what player, and we had different assistants calling each. We gave them, assigned them each play, teams to call. And... The best trade we made was trading Jose Guillen, who we had signed as a free agent and he, on a one-year contract, so I knew he was going to be, a, he was having a really good year, and we traded him for Aaron Harang, who ended up being a real solid pitcher for a long time for the Reds. So tell me about, um, you have, you know, baseball's different than college basketball or college football. I mean, you have a minor league system, and you have colleges. You know, Dodge Tucci has a great baseball program here. So... 
how do you how does that system work when you're when you're a major league whether you're a scout or whether you're a major league organization you've got you obviously have both you know kids that are going to come out of high school and go right into the to the minor league system you have kids that will go to college for four years how did you think about that or how's how does that how, how does it work for you do you is it a um, would you prefer to have an 18 year old right out of high school would you prefer to have someone who's had some experience in college did it matter well that's a great question because as our son is playing baseball right now he's a senior pitcher at the University of Cincinnati and I thought as he was growing up and you could see he was a pretty good baseball player but I think there's a great value in a college education not just what you learn in the classroom but just growing socially emotionally there's so many factors that you really become go from a boy to a man through your four college years so I think college education is huge and I always wondered boy if a team comes along how much money would it be worth for him to give up that college that college experience, not just the education, but that experience. And because one thing, too, as part of signing a high school player, we give them a college, the college scholarship plan. In other words, we say, hey, we'll pay for your college. At whatever college they were committed to, we'll pay them. But you sign a pro contract, now you play rookie ball, now you play A ball, then you play double A in a couple years, and now things aren't quite working out. Maybe you hurt your arm, or you're just not quite good enough for the younger guys start passing you by, and you can see the writing on the wall. Now you're 23, 24, 25 even. Oh, we give you your release. Now what do I do? Now you're going to go back and start college? It's tough. So a lot of guys just don't end up, even though they have a college scholarship, don't go use it because they're older. So I think there's huge value. And one thing I've seen, our scouts, scouts will go into a house and say, oh, we're going to take care of your son. We're going to take care of him. And you give you this college, college scholarship. And even they'll sign a junior. Because baseball, once you commit to a four-year school, you can't go pro until after your junior year. So you have one year left of college. But even then, they sign you, then they want you to go to instructional league in the fall, and you're back in spring training in the spring, and it's really tough to get back and, and finish your degree. So I think the college education is just huge. So you had a great background, a lot of experience in, in athletics, and then you decided to do something different. Uh, you decided to build upon your experiences, um, and it really part of why we have you here to, uh, is to talk about this notion of hardwiring, um, hardwiring for life. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that and kind of, kind of walk us through a little bit where it started. When, so what did you do and why did you leave baseball, that amazing, glamorous world of baseball, to chase a different kind of dream? So. Well, as statistical analysis got deeper and deeper, you know, I felt that we were reaching a point of diminishing returns. There's only so many statistics you can really analyze and they're still doing even more and more stuff, but I think the, the easy evaluation in statistics has been done as far as baseball goes. But there was one area, and, and I'm a big believer, and I was at the forefront of the Moneyball revolution and everything. We were doing the same, a lot of the same stuff at the Reds that Billy Bean was doing when Brad Pitt played him in the movies. But uh, there was one area that statistical analysis was not uncovering any new ground in, and that was something we called in baseball, we call in sports, makeup. How many people in here have taken a personality test? How many of you have taken the same personality test twice? Wow, that's a lot. I won't ask you individually how it came out, but I've seen research that over half the people that take the same personality test a second time come out a different type. And we tried to use these personality tests with our players. We had amateur players when we were coming out of high school or college, and we'd give them a test. And there was even companies that if they had taken the test, they'd have to take it for each team. But you know, if they had taken the test, you could buy the results from them. And so we'd get these personality tests on it and read it and say, hmm, interesting. And we put it in their file, never to be seen again. Because the fact is, from what I saw, these tests were very general and they really had no actionable information, no insights that we could use to make him a better player or help him with his career. So I felt that makeup was really the holy grail, the next frontier of player evaluation and player development, really understanding what makes these players tick. Like we were in a meeting with one of our minor league coaches and he was talking about this, a player. Well, we got a problem with this player. Now he's a great guy. He's the type of boy you would like your daughter to marry. But we can't get him to slide in hard at second base and break up a double play. So you know, what is good makeup? What is bad makeup? And we, had a, we, we would devote at our, Fall organization meetings, we'd have one day talking about 
the minor league system, how we're going to do this. We developed a whole day to discussing makeup. What is makeup? And different guys stand up. I think it's this. I think it's that. And it's something we could not even, nobody could agree on. So makeup was kind of the hot button issue. And finally, one year with the research and development program, we brought in a guy that had some amazing new insights. And I felt this was the answer to at least quantifying and understanding makeup in a way that we could all talk about. And I know who this person was, but tell me about who that was and what was his background. I thought it was kind of interesting to kind of see what his background was and what he was doing. So yeah. Well, his name was Jonathan Neednoggle, and his background was as an investment analyst. And he really had no expertise in that, but he went, it was back in the 60s or early 70s, his, he worked in the Midwest and they opened up a new office on the West Coast. And so he was sent out there to open the office and he didn't want, he was in charge of staffing the office and he didn't want to just go through asking cursory questions and making decisions on who to hire. He wanted to have a more sound basis on how to go about hiring and staffing the office. So he started researching psych psychological profiles, different personality inventories and he found a lot of them as I found with the Reds, just didn't seem to have a lot of substance. But then Carl Jung is the one, most people don't realize the foundation, the origins of most personality tests go back to when they were trying to, do, to figure out who was sane and who was crazy, who had some type of psychological disorder. Carl Jung is the one person that based his research on the study of thousands and thousands of normal, ordinary, everyday people. And he found, Neednagel found Jung's work to really be the most substantive, so he started researching that and used that and staffed his office and he went ahead and as he started day-to-day -day work after that, he, he found that he could still apply this a little bit, meeting people, he recognized things about them and thought it was interesting. He started coaching his kids' little league teams and there he started to notice that how come this sensing feeling boy uses his big muscles when he throws the ball, uses his whole body and then this Conceptual anal analytic boy, this conceptual thinking boy, it was more fine motor, just used his hand when he threw the ball. And so he started to notice some motor skill correlation with the mental aspects of these kids. And so one of the kids' dads, and this was back in the late 70s, and one of the kids' dads was a, a professor at the neuroscience department at a local college, and he said, hey, he explained what he was seeing here, and the guy said, well, I don't know, but we have the motor cortex run down outside the brain, and if there's some relationship, I'd start your research there. And so he started researching that, did a lot of work, talking to neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, and developed this concept of how we call the hardwired makeup, is what I call it. So let's talk about that more. It's pretty interesting when you, so I, I know as I read some of the things in your book, you, you argued that there are things that are the kind of ingrained into us that we're born with, if you will, um, is that are they limiting factors for us? Um, you use example of being right-handed or left-handed, I know, but is it limiting? So, um, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm still probably not going to be a pitcher for the Houston Astros. I aspire to that, but um, that's probably not going to happen. But it, was I limited from birth? Are you a glass half empty guy, Homer? <laughs> because you could say, is it empowering? Yes, I believe every person is born with special giftedness, and we also all, hate to tell you, we also have some natural inherent limitations. I could want to be an NBA center, and it's not going to happen. How many people in here are left handed? How many of you lefties wish you were right handed? None? It's a right handed world, isn't it? But if you wanted to be right-handed, you know, you can try to focus on using your right hand and you can do it a lot. But when pressure hits and you're scrambling, you got to do something on the spur of the moment, you may, you will probably switch back to your dominant hand. You know, for right, maybe more for righties the same way you try to use your left hand. And is that limiting? Maybe for a lefty, if you only have right-handed scissors, it could be limiting, I guess, but... You know, understand, understanding that you can develop your weakness as best you can, and, and it's the most important part of self-understanding, I believe. So, okay, so now I'm understanding my strengths and limitations, my empowerment that I can go for with that. So how do you, again, looking at the research that, the, again, your, your mentor kind of did, he supposedly would go in and, in a very short period of time, observe 
people and come to conclusions that were incredibly accurate, right? I mean, you, there was a story about, was it Vic Braden, the tennis player? Um, what was that about? And that, I thought that was a really interesting story. Well, Vic Braden was a renowned tennis coach and also a licensed, I believe you say licensed psychologist. And so Neednock was living in Southern California and people started to talk about this and Vic Braden heard about it. He said, that's crazy. There's no way. Motor skills related to mental skills, that's nuts. So he said, I will prove this guy wrong. So he invited Neednock to come down to his tennis academy. And over the course of a year, he had a hundred of his tennis students sit down for just a short one-on-one -on -one interview with Neednoggle, and Neednoggle would predict how they would play on the tennis court, how their strengths and weaknesses in their tennis game, what type of game they would play, power game, finesse game, that sort of thing. And Braden testified that he was 100% accurate. Every single person, and even these, some of these people, there was a doctor of psychology that I think was one of the, the uh, students there, and he said he was so right it was eerie, and he didn't want to talk about it. He was freaked out. But the correlation was unquestionable. So, so do you think you can do that? Can you, when you meet someone, are you able now with your system, your develop system, can you, can you tell what you think someone's going to be successful at a certain well, it's, what's going on? It's not just success, but I mean, it's just it's tendencies, really. And so each of us, it's clues. It's the way that you pro Each of us, we all have two ways of engaging in life. First, we perceive something, then we give it thought. And each of us does these one of, in one of two ways. We perceive it either with our five senses, what we can see, what we can taste, what we can smell, what we can touch, what we can hear, or our sixth sense, our imagination, intuitiveness. Now, obviously, we all use our five senses, but many of us, and I imagine many entrepreneurs, many of the people in this room, as soon as, you, as, soon as you've taken something with your five senses, you're already thinking, hey, we can do this, we can do that. You, the, the idea people, the visionaries. They use that sixth sense a lot. They, we call them conceptuals. And as we give it thought, we do it in one of two ways also, either empathetically, subjectively, more emotionally, or objectively, more logically. And we call that analytic. So there's, that gives us four types, actually four types of intelligences. And I think you would not be surprised that conceptual analytics, those who can think abstract, think conceptually, theoretically, and analytically using logic, using rationality, those are the ones that tend to do the best in college. So I have a friend who uh, is, does, does research on entrepreneurs. And he argues that uh, you can tell an entrepreneur easily because they always back into their garage so that when they get ready in the morning, they get up and they're ready to go for it and launch out. Well, now, I'm a, I'm a sci scientifically solid. Is that a quirk? Is that a tendency? It's do definitely a quirk. So, yeah. <laughs> so do, you know, can you tell that I was going to be a dean or be um, an unsuccessful baseball player or whatever? Um, by I told you, Homer, based on your sweet swing, I th think you should have stuck in baseball a little good. longer. It is, yeah. We had a great time together. Or, yeah. So can you tell that just from a conversation? Well, see, that's it. You know, people say it all the time. Well, you prove it. You can't do it. And it's not that simple. People are very complex. And the old question, nature versus nurture. And I'm saying this is the nature aspect. Nurture is a huge part of our lives. You know, obviously, you could take someone that's qualified, that, that has the innate ability to be a brain surgeon. And if you have him grow up in the bush in Africa and never give him proper nutrition, don't let him have any books, he's not going to be a brain surgeon. Okay, in the same way you can take, but you can't take someone that's not gifted with conceptual analytical thought process and put them in the brain surgery program because not because really they don't have the capability but they're not going to be interested in it they're going to get bored they're not going to be able to keep up with their studies they're not going to have okay, the passion so, to learn. all right so i got ethics questions now so is it limiting and i i asked it before but is so are you when you go in and you talk to i don't care if it's, if it's a, a major league team or if it's a company you're talking to them about employees so are you, are you limiting someone in the course of analyzing? Are you are limiting their possibilities? So if you, if you tell a uh, major league general manager or if you tell the owner of a company, 
this person's limited. You got to know there's like things that they they're not going to be able to do. They've got strengths, but nature has limited them in certain ways, and so they can't go beyond that. Are you are you stifling their potential? That's that's, that's the, the big concern, concern with any of this stuff, right? Is that everyone's being labeled? They're being, but I would say I'm helping. My my goal, and you asked why I left baseball. Why I want I want to share this with the world. I want to help each person live their best life possible. And that means, you know, finding a job, finding a life really, not just a job, but finding your time out of your job, but something that you feel makes you feel you have, your life has meaning. You're living a worthwhile life. And at your job then, if you're doing, you know, just because we make you the president, if you don't want to be dealing with all these problems and everything, you know, being dean isn't all it's cracked up to be, is it Homer? Not. Most days. <laughs> Most days. But there's some issues you've got to deal with, and you've got to be ready. You said you're traveling on the road a lot. Some people might not like traveling. So just because I make them dean doesn't mean they're going to be happy and love it. So it's, it's really finding each person, putting in the right role. And I think just because someone is not made the manager or made the head coach, that doesn't mean that their life is automatically miserable. You know, and so I think it's working with each person and, and appreciating their strengths and putting them in a position to succeed and be the best they can be. And I believe that in the future... The true companies, the true diversity of the future will not be skin color, gender, nationality, any of those things. It will be mental diversity and having people that have different perspectives and can really complement each other to give you the most well-rounded perspective. I, I know we can't today because of time go through it because I guess there are 16 different frames in the system as you look at it in your book. But can you talk, maybe give us a couple of examples, maybe of a a person or something that you've seen as an example of a couple of those and what it's like. Maybe I know you identify a lot of people in your book, like a lot of real world individuals. Can you can you pull any of those out to kind of say this this is an example of a person who fits this kind of type? Um, I know you have creative thinkers and you have all kind of different things in there. So, well, one thing just to, I've already given you four aspects of perception and thought, and then there's two hemispheres of the brain, and then a front and back region of each one. So four times four, that gives us the 16 different combinations of the hardwired makeup. One guy I can comment on, it's not TCU, but he's Texas, and that's Vince Young. I don't know if you remember Vince Young, great quarterback at University of Texas. And the story, when he was a senior having his great year, go to the Rose Bowl, beat my Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, I think, was Mac Brown still the coach then? I don't know if it was Mac Brown or, but it doesn't matter. We're at TCU. It doesn't, that de details don't matter. But what they said was, they Vince Young, you talk about limiting, okay? Vince Young, very gifted athletically, no doubt. But he is not a conceptual analytic thinker. He's a very emotionally street smart guy. He's a sensate, sees things very well, and an empathetic. So more emotional, but he plays on emotion. You know, when things are going good, can be... Very good when things not going good, not so good. But his senior year, I read that they really simplified the playbook, let him see the defense, make the call, and you know, if the play wasn't there, run the ball. If he had his man, pass the ball, and really gave him the freedom to just go out and play and have fun. And he had a great year. So then he goes to the NFL. I think, I think he was number one draft pick. Goes to the NFL. Great athlete. It's going to be a superstar. And what's the first thing they do in the NFL? Here's the playbook. It's like a phone book. Study this thing. He's like, oh. So he's reading all this stuff, having to memorize all these concepts, all these things. And so he gets up the line. Now instead of seeing the defense stuff, he's thinking, what's the play? What's a Why banana two, right? Blue? What? I can't remember. How. So they got him thinking so much, and his play just went down the tubes. And so really the key is, for, for, if you knew you had a player like that, it's not limiting, but you've got to coach to your talent. Right? You've got to put, if you want to put Vince Young in position to succeed, you better simplify that playbook and help him be able to utilize his gifts, which is his athletic ability. You know, one of the things we, I, in recruiting faculty, I interview all of the new faculty that are, that are applying for jobs. And, I, and one of the things I do tell them uh, is that, you know, we obviously want them to, we're proud of TCU, we want them to come here if it's the right place for them. And I always mean that. I want it, you know, I want them to find the right place for them. And if it's TCU, that's great. If not, you know, I want to celebrate somewhere else. So when you, when you work with a company or a professional team, so... Do you find there are players or employees that aren't going to fit the organization? Are you able to, using your system to, 
to match that? Or is it, or can anyone fit anywhere, do you think? So. Well, that's kind of an open-ended question. Can anyone fit anywhere? I don't know that I would say yes to that. But, you know, think about that. As, a, as an employer, as someone in charge of hiring people, you hi when you hire someone, obviously you have high hopes for that person. You're not hiring them to put them in a position to fail, right? You're hiring them, and what's the worst possible thing that can happen? Well, I don't know if it's the worst possible thing, but if you have to later really, I gotta fire this person, I hired him. I mean, that, that's awful. Nobody, very few people like firing. I think there's a few that do, but and th th that is something actually is hardwired. I think there's an aspect of that. But, you know, hiring people, managing people, you're trying to put them in position where they feel fulfilled, where they are happy. You know, even retaining them, that's a big part of business now. You put all this work into training, and now they go to your competitor. So you want them to be feeling fulfilled in their role. You want them to be happy. So you're trying to put them in a position to succeed. And you're not going to hire someone that, that you don't think is fit for a role just because you don't want them to not be limited. Do organizations, though, themselves, like with the Cincinnati Reds at a given time, I know it changes over time, do they have a character? Is, is the organization, is it the... The, the management team, you know, here we have, you know, in our, in our sports programs, we have different coaches who have different styles, different ways they approach. So are there players that would fit with those coaches? Um, you know, how, how tight and can, can the hardwiring piece help them in thinking about potential players or whatever? Well, I think, again, you know, what happens when a team fails, you can't fire all the players, so you end up firing the coach. And inevitably, if the team was kind of undisciplined, you're bringing a taskmaster, taskmaster that's going to get everyone, bring discipline back to the program. And then all the guys, after a couple of years, everyone, oh, he's just wearing us down. He's too tough. He's too tough. Now we've got to bring in a nice guy that's going to be a player's coach. And then there's lack of organization. You go back to a taskmaster. And it's kind of this back and forth, back and forth, go around in a circle. And, you know, I think we've realized that the my way or the highway style of leadership is really not optimal into, as we find out more and more about managing people. And really, same thing, in a company, you're not gonna fire everyone in the company, right? You're gonna get a new CEO, a new manager, you're gonna get a new person in charge. And so, if you're the person in charge, I think the best thing you can do is try and put each employee in position, again, to max, not to limit the people, but to maximize each person's strengths minimize their weaknesses and put them in a position where they feel fulfilled and they feel that they're doing something, and I think more and more in today's day and age, that they're doing something important, at least something valuable with their time and their life. And I think in any business, you know, you could be running the garbage company, pick up the garbage, but still, if they feel they're helping beautify the environment, keeping things clean and doing things right, and, and they feel they're an important part of a company doing something that does good work, you know, er I think anyone managed properly can feel that they are doing something good. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a challenge. Then we're going to open to the audience because I want to have a chance to have other people ask questions. So some of the ideas behind this I've heard for a long time. I mean, I heard my parents, my dad was a coach, and he would say some of the similar kinds of things. What is this, why is the science of it, if you will, why does the science make such a difference in the work that you're doing? Um, as opposed to the common sense. So why is this, this 16 system, why is it important? Because now you can do it from the get-go. In the past, it's always been trial and error as you try and figure out and build a relationship with a person. Now you can hire this person on day one, and with this insight, you can have, you can almost feel like you know them, or at least know how they, they tick, what's inside. You know, what will motivate them, what will frustrate them, what will make them excited to come to work, what will make them dread coming to work, and try and put, from, from day one, at least make it an environment where each person, not just, oh, our company is nice, everyone has fun here, it's a great place, but that each person feels their role in the cause is something that they see has meaning. So do you test each individual coming in? Or do you observe them? Or what's, what do you do? So you, if you go in, if, I, if we hire you to come in for Neely School, School of Business, and help us recruit and hire people, what are you going to do? Well, that's the beauty of this, too. You know, everyone likes tests because tests are easy, right? You give a test, they fill it out, check the answers, here's your result. But the problem is with written questionnaires, they are inherently flawed because each of us, based on our 
background, based on our education, based on our hardwired makeup, the way we interpret things, we all interpret words and phrases differently. And even with a lot of personality tests, we answer questions the way we've been taught to believe we should think. So many of these tests, even though we may be feel good about our results because it's the way we see ourselves, often the way other people see us is different than the way we see ourselves. So because this is related to motor skills, everyone has clues that they give off, that you can see just by the way someone walks, by the way they talk, by the way they smile, by their appearance, by the way they dress. And some people are kind of easy reads, some people are much tougher reads. And because everyone is different and there's nuances and everyone's, we're not all one way or the other. And that's the thing, some of these tests, well, I'm, I'm extroverted, I'm introverted. How many, introverted do, how many introverts do we have in the room here today? A few. The ones raising your hand real high probably really aren't introverts. <laughs> and probably a few of the introverts didn't even raise their hand at all. So that's the thing, when you even ask that on a question, there's many people I've seen, you go to these Talks and someone sits on the stage and says, oh, I'm an introvert. I, I don't like being in front of people, but I've learned to do it. And, you, could, and, you know, they're probably not. But so as, as a part of the analysis, I have tried to develop a test because everyone loves tests so much. And asking questions is a great place to start. But like I said, everyone gives clues, so it's really constant evaluation. And so you would go through a process of an interview with the test and trying to dig deeper and find out what aspects of a person's persona maybe were learned nurture, and then what parts are really inborn nature. So this motor skills, this physical piece is so interesting to me. And I, we had someone in last week, um, and he's, he actually is a venture capitalist, um, but he was talking about one of the companies, and I thought it was fascinating, and I'll, I'll get this approximately right or wrong, whatever. Um, he was arguing that each one of us has particular movements in the way we move and, and act. So he gave the example that Again, I guess approximately right. Um, that the, one of the companies he's funded, uh, they actually work behind, and maybe Phil Norwood could help us with this because he probably does this cross bank. I guess behind the companies, uh, they work on our movements. So, as an example, when uh, when you log on to a, a bank site and you put your ID in and then you put your password in, he said the next thing that the company does, and you don't, we don't see it. Um, is that they move the cursor. And that the way that I move the cursor back to accept that, uh, to you know, click continue, is unique to me. And that, I thought it was fascinating, and that I guess he has 100 million people that they have data on. That's scary, it's like people in this room. Um, but that it's, it's a way to check that if you log onto my account and you move the cursor, it's not me. So that was fascinating. I'm not going to ask Phil if you got that behind the scenes or not. But, so <laughs> yeah. but that's a motor skill. And is that kind of the, part of what you're saying? Yeah, and, I, and that, one of the things that I've been trying to do when I've taken this time away from baseball, besides developing this test, learning all I could about this, was really trying to do more research. And my colleague, Jonathan Neednoggle, that discovered this, he was been involved in trying to do genetic testing. He believes that it that it, it must be genetically related because it is, we find traits down in family that there is a hereditary factor of this, so we believe it's definitely genetically linked, just like your hair color, your eye color, that sort of thing. And I think there's definitely more research to be done in that with m movements and that kind of thing. But like, for an example, if you see someone that tends to talk with their hands a lot and really animated when they talk, that's a clue, just another clue that it might be someone that's more, got hand-eye coordination, very fine motor skill. Okay, I want to open it to, Questions to the audience. Yeah. Yep. One of the most important things I learned when I went to Neely is to ask, whoops, excuse me. One of the most important things they taught me at Neely was to ask people what their R squared was. Presumably, when Moneyball was written, you had all kinds of predictions, but no outcomes to test the predictions against. Now we're 15 years down the road. How accurate are the models? And how often do you see outliers where the model predicts somebody's going to be greatly successful and they fail, or the model predicts somebody's going to be a failure and you look up later and they're greatly successful? Are you asking about Moneyball specifically? Or that Just about the predictive power of these kinds of models to predict human performance 
either. All I'm saying is when Moneyball happened, I assume you've got to look at a ball player over a multiple number of years. So you had these predictive models, but you didn't have multiple years of outcomes to measure the accuracy of the models against. Now, presumably, you do. So my question is, are you predi uh, what is the R squared? Are you predicting, are you 20% accurate or 90% accurate as far as predicting performance? With hardwired makeup? Well, once again, you know, training is a big part. Your environment is a big part of it, but it's very accurate as far as predicting the way people will be prone to think, behave, and perform. And that's the thing with Moneyball, with statistical analysis, it's only as good as the, the data you put in, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And if you have no data, statistical analysis isn't going to do you much good. And that's why when we're drafting a high school kid from down in South Georgia that you don't know who he's played against, just because he has 17 home runs, that doesn't really tell you a lot of information. We don't know what kind of fields, what kind of pitching he faced. So, and that's why baseball, more than any sport too, the accuracy of the draft is very inaccurate. When you ask about predictive data, the draft is still more of a crapshoot than it is sci uh, at least educated science. And we're making progress, but still, because you're dealing with human beings, just being away from home the first time, statistical analysis isn't, go isn't going to tell you how they're going to react, being on the road, away from their mom, having to do their own laundry, having all kinds of free time. And that's why professional athletes, too, especially in the other sports where they get this huge signing bonus, these big contracts, now they're out of college, they don't have a guidance counselor, they don't have coaches on them all the time, and they got all this free time and all this money. And that's what you can imagine back when, before, when drugs were much more of an issue, the, the, you were prone to get, into, get off the rails. But there's no question that the, the insight in this gives you at least a head start at trying to see who might be more vulnerable to different aspects of development. No, no, no. Need Noggle was interviewing each subject and just asking them about what kind of, just talking to, basically having a conversation. He was reading them, doing a hot read, essentially, while he was talking to them. And then he told Vic, on the, he didn't see their motor skills at all, but he told Vic, on the tennis court, they will move like this, they will play like this. And basically just gave predictions about their style of play, their mannerisms on the court, their mental approach to the game, and that sort of thing. And so Vic had been working with these people, and so he knew them. And then he... And, Neednoggle gave the subject his evaluation as well, and they, were, they, they said it was uncanny that he was on the, on the, now on the mark, you know, I don't know, I did not, I was not involved in that study, but Braden just raved about it. And Braden, the, the, point, the biggest point is that Braden was, he constructed this study to disprove this. He was going to shoot this down. And by the time it was over, he was Neednoggle's biggest supporter. And we went on ESPN and all kinds of stuff saying, guys, this is, this is the wave of the future. And Part of the problem, I was working with Neednoggle trying to help him learn all I could. He's, you know, sometimes the person that makes the discovery is not the one that's really going to be able to bring it to the world because his specialty is really in reading people, not reading them so much, but picking out little nuances and focusing on little aspects and looking for these clues like I talked about. And he did not do a very good job of promoting it or a very good job explaining it. And I even know when he came in and worked with us at the Reds, a lot of people were like, what is this guy talking about? You had to spend a lot of time really picking it apart. And so when he came with the Reds, he came in, we were doing a managerial interview, and he interviewed all three managerial finalists, and then they left, and he came in to the manager committee, managerial search committee. And so he started writing on the board. He drew two hemispheres of the brain, and he starts talking about where each guy's hardwired in the brain. I'm writing, scribbling notes down here. We never had any, you know, baseball, we're chew tobacco and talk about throwing fastballs. You know, we'd never had a discussion like this in our, with many of the old former scouts we had on the search committee and this sort of thing. So it was really a new way of talking about people. And the remarkable thing, he was right on the mark with these three people. He said, two of the people, Ron Oster and Bob Boone, had been in our organization. We knew them very well, and he described them to a T. And Willie Randolph, former second baseman of the Yankees, was the other finalist, and we, the search committee really liked him. And he said, one of the reasons you guys probably like Willie Randolph is he's hardwired very similar to a lot of the members on the search committee here. He said, ah, he's thinking like we are, that's why. So it, any, every, anyway, everything he said, I, I didn't prove it or disprove it, but it all made sense. And that's what I'm talking about, this aspect of science. 
as increasing computer power has allowed us to do more with analysis of performance, I believe that increases, advances in the hard sciences are enabling us to better understand and quantify what is going on with people. And so as we uncover more and more stuff with hard science, all of this stuff just continues to make more and more sense. And so real quickly, what happened after he left, my boss said, hey, what do you think about this need nano guy? And I said, I don't know what to think, but if there's something to this, somewhere in here, there's a competitive advantage, and as a small mid-market team like the Reds, I said, we gotta hire this guy, and we gotta figure out what we can do with this. And he said, I think you're right. Sign him to a consultant contract, and you be his main liaison. I said, okay. So sign him up, and he w he'd come in and out of town. He'd be bringing him in periodically, but while he was gone, he gave us a book he had written, and we're going through the book, and guys would come to my office, we'd talk about it. I said, what about this? What about Kobe Bryant? You know, what he, he does that. I said, oh, that's a great question. So I write this down, and by the time Neednagel would come back into town, I had a list of like 75 questions. I said, all right, John, sit down. We're going to talk here. I'm going to, I got some issues with what's going on. And every question I'd ask him, his response is, always made sense. And so I ended up taking him, we went around the country, so I was looking for a particular type of players. I was really looking for the next Pete Rose, pre-gambling Pete Rose, back when he was a <laughs> great player. But that's, that's another issue too, and again, a hardwired aspect of his ultra competitiveness. But we had a hard time, and actually, there, I, I believe that, you talk about limiting, I'm worried there's some hardwired makeup types that are, I would consider endangered species. I'd like to see them make sure that we don't lose any because I think some are inordinately valued in our computer age. But I took him around to trial camps around the country, looking at different players and everything, and, and again, I put him to the test time after time after time, and never once was I able to say, ha, you're wrong. Not that I could prove it, but it all, everything always made sense. It made sense of issues we were having, and so. Well, I can tell you it will help with your golf game. It, it, no, a, a, any athletic movements, really. And the only reason athletics is so, such a focal point of this is because the motor skills are on display. Obviously, your bank manager is not really using his motor skills so much, but the motor skill correlation, if you just see them walking to lunch, you can see some clues sometimes in the way someone's gait. And you know, even there's computer models now that they can tell by someone's gait when they walk, if they may have explosives strapped on or something like that, they're starting to use these at airports and stuff like that. So the concept that we each show clues in the way that we move is not something I've just made up. You know, it's, it's becoming commonplace. And I think as more and more, once again, as we learn more and more research, I think there's much more to uncover here. Um, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. I have a quick question about, um, I am a banker, so I'm not going to take offense, because I do use motor skills quite a bit. I do, I promise. Um, and mostly in my golf game, but we won't talk about that. Um, kind of what you're talking about, and I am uh, currently at TCU um, School of Business, and we are taught about Myers-Briggs. And a lot of the examples that you gave, intuitive sensing, introvert, extrovert, I mean, in companies we go through that. We learn how to work together because we have, you know, our conflict analysis. Um, What's the difference between what you're doing and what businesses and schools like TCU hire with these tests to learn about how we interact with the world? And how does that relate to sports? And what really is the difference to what you're doing versus what a Myers-Briggs does? Accuracy. Really? The Myers-Briggs. And because Myers-Briggs, Isabel Myers, and her mother was Catherine Briggs, and she was, Catherine Briggs was the first one that was a big fan of Carl Jung's work. She was working on her own personality test, and she read Jung's Psychology of Type, came over here to the United States in 1923, and she said, oh my gosh, this is it, this is what I've been looking for. And so then it was actually later, in the beginning of the World War, uh, World War II, that Isabel Myers developed what became the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. And that's the one I was referring to, that studies of that is that people that take it a second time, over half the people come out with a different type. And the problem with it is, and they're on the right track because they're, a student of Jung, just like this, all emanates from Carl Jung. But, you know, if you take, do you know how many questions are on a Myers-Briggs test? I mean, say there's 100 questions, so that's 25, and really they're trying to measure each dyad, each letter. Are you thinking versus feeling? Are you intuitive versus sensing? And if there's 25 questions, 
If you answer 13 one way and 12 the other, then the result spits out, oh, you're the 13. And if you take it, and you know, some of these questions, you're like, oh, I don't know, I'm like this sometimes, I'm like that sometimes, I'll put this one. Well, you take it the next time and you say, eh, today I'm feeling this way, so you take the other one. Now you're 13, 12 the other way, it spits out a different answer. And the other problem is, you know, we're not all just front brain or back brained. These letters, these aspects of our being tend to work together. So some have an impact on others. That someone that's an introvert, but they're, they're a feeling people-oriented person, they can extrovert when they're around people because they just enjoy being around people. And so they may seem extroverted, may even think of themselves as extroverted in ways, and vice versa. So it works in a variety of ways. And what I'm saying is the questionnaires are a valuable starting point, but with Myers-Briggs, it ends there. And with hardwired makeup, we have clues that you can use as follow-ups. It can be done in an interview to ask questions to get people to talk about. Sometimes when somebody even talks about why they answer questions a certain way, you can say, well, do you think maybe you're thinking about it like this? And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm really not that way normally, except at work, I have to be that way. Yes. So your approach would be more, so your approach would be more stable over time than MBTI would be? Well, it's more substantive, so yes, I think that it, it gives you more of the, the insight into the person's true inner being. And, you know, we do mature as we get older. I don't think your hard wiring necessarily changes, but, you know, if, if I'm right-handed and work on using my left hand very consciously, as I grow older, I'm able to become maybe somewhat ambidextrous. I don't know I'd ever write with my left hand, but you can become more balanced, I guess, as you grow older. And that's why people, that MBTI, they change because as we get more mature and we're in a different environment, you may evolve in ways that you think about things, and so people think their types change over time, but I don't believe your hardwired makeup does. We have time for one more question. So, any other, one more question. So, we answered them all. Answered them all. Um, I would encourage you, uh, I, I read through the book, the hardwiring book, and it was really kind of fun. I had to think. Hard that's, to think. that's one issue here. And that's the thing. We all want everything to be so simple. And that's why companies like these tests. Give them the test and just tell me the results, and then we'll hire the person. Yeah. But, you know, if you're – and that may be fine for a low-level hire, but you, like I said, when you hire someone, you really have high hopes for that person in general, especially if you're going to be their supervisor. So you think, you know, the, the more work you want to put into it, it does take some effort. And look, it's a continual search for clues. Even sometimes when I think someone's a certain – design, I'll still keep watching, and maybe over time I notice some things about them, and I might say, you know, I think maybe I was wrong based on this additional information, because it's just continual search for clues. remember a few years ago, I was at a, actually led a Dean's Conference, and we were, um, part of the story was to climb Camelback Mountain in Arizona, so we did that, and we did, we used the DISC inventory test, and one of the persons um, clearly was a D, a dominant in the, by that. And she took that. And I remember, so we were at the top of the mountain, getting ready to come back down. And we had all said to this person, you clearly are a D. And she said, oh, I'm not really a D. I was like, I'm not dominant. I'm influenced. I'm kind of second. And we said, no, you're D. Well, so anyway, what I, we said was, okay, what we're going to do now is we start down the mountain. Uh, <clears throat> we want you to lead, but lead in silence. And so we all got behind her. And so she began to lead us down the mountain. I turned to the group, and I went, stop. She went on for 10 minutes by herself without anybody else with her. So I think there's something to this. Some people are just hardwired to be dominant and nothing they can do about it. Um, and so with that. So Brad, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's been really fun to, to know Brad as a, as a child. Uh, to follow his career throughout, and he's going to spend some time with our students today and tomorrow and kind of sharing in more detail, because uh, it is a pretty complex system that he has to go through. Um, thank you for being here with us, and we're going to our next attending executive speaker series is October 31st. Uh, one of our graduates, Majeev Kranz, is going to be with us. He's the senior vice president and head of innovation group for Cisco, uh, and if you want to read his book ahead of time, it's a New York bestseller on uh, the Internet of Things. So thanks for being here this morning, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks.